and welcome to tonight's the uh, Tiger webinar. We're happy to have you join us today, and we hope that our entire Tiger family is well. Uh, as we all continue to adapt to this new working environment, we want you to know that RIT's Office of Alumni Relations is available to help all alumni with a variety of needs, including new virtual content, learning opportunities, and networking and career assistance through our current work and life realities. If you are not already connected to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, we encourage you to follow these accounts. You will find up-to-date um, communications and opportunities to connect with other Tiger alumni in your region and your industry through the Alumni Association social media. Those links are found in the chat box, and the chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of your webinar window. Many of our RIT family members have asked how they can help our students and the university as we respond to the pandemic and prepare for the fall semester, which starts ne next week. Is that right? No, two weeks. Well, well <laughs> don't, don't. faculty work on the 12th. Don't, don't rush me. Okay. Yep. Two weeks. Two weeks. Um, <laughs> We are so grateful for uh, the many offers that we have had for help, uh, and we want to let you know that there are two things that you could do to help us as well. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers and co-ops, respectively. Uh, many of these positions have been delayed or canceled entirely. And if your company is hiring or would consider adding a co-op post, please contact Chris Steeler in RIT's Career Services Office and allow her to post that position in our systems. In addition, as RIT prepares for the return of students in two weeks, there is now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for continuing and incoming Tiger students. If you are able, please consider making a gift at the link in the chat box to our scholarship fund, and we thank you very much. Now, just a few housekeeping points. We want to ensure that everyone is familiar with the presentation tool. If you are joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the transmission. The platform is secure without VPN. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat box at any time throughout the discussion and we'll make every effort to address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. You, uh, you are joining the event using broadcast audio, and if you wish to dial in by phone, dial-in information is provided in the chat box. Live captioning is also being provided, and you can find the link to access that in the chat box as well. This webinar will be recorded and made available, complete with captions, in approximately one week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And now on to tonight's webinar, Wine 101, the Super 7. We are happy to welcome back Lorraine Hems in the second event to celebrate wines of the world. Lorraine is a 2012 alumna who has been in the wine and spirits industry at the retail, wholesale, and educational levels for over 40 years. She currently teaches wine and spirits studies as a full-time lecturer in the Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management, now part of the Saunders College of Business at RIT. Lorraine is also a certified Bordeaux educator with La Col de Vin de Bordeaux, Sopexa. She stays active in the wine industry through SWE, Women for Wine Sense, and the American Wine Society, that include volunteering, teaching at local events, and presenting at national conferences. In 2012, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from, Award from the National Chapter of Women for Wine Sense. Lorraine is an active advocate for the wines of the Finger Lakes, the area that she calls home. Even though she is lucky enough to live in such a lovely wine region, she still enjoys traveling, particularly while checking the various wine regions of the world off of her spit bucket list while presenting and judging at wine and spirits competitions throughout the world. Tonight's event is offered in partnership with Club McKenzie in the Labazo Alumni House and Saunders College. Club McKenzie programs are named for Provost Emeritus Stan McKenzie, celebrating Stan's love of learning, laughter, and libation. 
Club McKenzie is an evening of wit, wisdom, and intellectual stimulation featuring favorite RIT presenters. And we are pleased to welcome one of our favorites back again. Lorraine, thank you very much. And our audience is all yours. Oh my gosh, what a great introduction. Thank you. Uh, yes, learning and libation, uh, that's, that's certainly, laughter should be included. Um, we are going to do all three, I hope, tonight because I don't take wine too seriously. Uh, there's enough other things in our lives that are so serious. But uh, playing off a little bit for some of those who are here for the first part, uh, we'll see a couple familiar slides, a couple familiar um, things that will keep us uh, connected to that. But uh, really playing off of uh, that. And if you weren't at the first one, this is part two. So we're going to just play with some more information, have some fun, promote the Finger Lakes, uh, talk a little bit about France again, and um, maybe some of the other regions. Uh, food pairings thrown in at the end. If we have time, we'll uh, take even more questions about the pairings because that could be another part three. Uh, not that I'm asking, but uh, that would be uh, plenty to do. Uh, I do a whole 14 session semester, so uh, tra trapping it all into an hour, uh, we can't do it all, but please do ask a lot of questions. Please don't let your glass get empty. I'm drinking a little Hazlitt Sauvignon Blanc. That seems to be a great summer white, which we'll talk about more later. So keep those questions coming. For those of you who were here before, I did talk a little bit about why France. Why do we always talk about France with an accent that is better than mine, maybe? But France really documented a lot of and regulated a lot of what they did with uh, the growing of grapes and the winemaking. And certainly with their diversity of climate and soils, north to south, west to east, there is a variation that's extraordinary. But that's really where we're setting up for our Super 7, the, uh, generally the top grapes of the world, that no matter where in the world they're planted, they seem to have these same great characteristics that are similar. So, oh, if I do a blind tasting of Sauvignon Blanc, I can maybe guess, oh, this style is from New Zealand, this style is from New York, this style is from France. And same grape, but there's all these similarities and characteristics, but different. And so that's what we're going to delve into a little bit today. And something that had been mentioned before was uh, WSET. That's something I'm very proud of, that I did a lot of studies with the Wine and Spirit Education Trust and took many of their exams, uh, have started the diploma program. Don't know if I'll finish because I, I love teaching about wine and maybe don't have enough time for everything. But I love how this could be sort of the basis for learning more about wine and obtaining certifications, not just WSET, but SWE or Corps de Sommeliers, that the basic information that they provide, no matter where in the world, because this started in 1969 and they're in over 70 countries and almost 20 different languages. But this, uh, many of the slides I'll share with you tonight have uh, just the intro level. And I love the simplicity, but the graphics that they provide that can really set in. I'm a visual learner, and I really like to know more about wine. I know I'll never know everything because everything keeps changing. So uh, laws change, uh, new countries, new regions. And uh, so for the person out there that's wondering, really, New York State does produce good red wines? Yes, they do. And maybe you bought one tonight, but highlights of Finger Lakes and many other regions, focusing on just the, begin the beginning, the basics, because a lot of people <clears throat> don't start at the beginning. And I know when I started in a liquor store, I didn't know anything. And so I had to ask a lot of questions and got a lot of great answers, thankfully, to the people that were working with me. And that patience in them and their knowledge really inspired me to keep going and sort of do the same thing, always with a bit of that laughter though, because I don't I don't want it to be snobby. That that's too much pressure. But this WSET could eventually lead you in a direction of one of those rare master of wine uh, positions after many years of study. So moving on. Um, the new world. We talked a little bit last time about old world, new world. And basically the old world, old world traditions, old world uh, techniques and all that set into place really being an inspiration for others around the world. But old world is location, location, location. 
even if I open up a winery in um, in Italy tomorrow, who pays for my airfare? Oh wait, no quarantine. Uh, back up. Okay, so if I go to Italy and open up a winery after things calm down, that would still be considered an old winery because of its location and following maybe the tradition. When you hear these people talking about how harvests were many, many decades or centuries ago, it's incredible the work that they've done to document these. And, and there's reasons why those grapes do well in those locations. New World, hey, we can do whatever we want. We have less regulations. We can experiment and be innovative and try different grapes uh, planted in different soils and different everything. And so maybe all of that newness, we begin to look back to the old world again for ideas about how to be more successful, about planting grapes in what has turned out to be after all these years, maybe the best locations for those grapes. So it's not to say that we're competing with the old world if we're in a new world location, there can be different styles and we do see that. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on, sort of this old world, new world, um, maybe old world being, a little more reserved, and I don't mean reserved as far as collector's reserve, but reserved, um, maybe not as upfront, big front, in, in your face, bold, fruity flavors and oak flavors that you might see with some of the newer world wineries that want more impact. And maybe that's reflected in our pairings that we might be bigger, bolder versus some of the more subtle flavors and pairings we might see in the old world. So old world, new world, we see about the same places, about 30 to 50 degrees latitude in Northern and Southern hemisphere that will be good for planting grapes. And our wine basics, we talked about the last time, but easy to play catch up here. There's this big word that I got a lot of comments on from my former students, thank you very much. Uh, terroir, and not a tiny white angry dog, which some people answered on their exams, uh, but the environmental impact on that vine. And so I can go that vine, that row, that vineyard, and out from there. But our climate really doesn't change <laughs> because it's that location. In the Finger Lakes, we're continental climate. So we have extremes in our weather between summer, winter, and then springs and falls. Well, if we get them, then that's great too. But that's something that we are used to seeing here. Um, Mediterranean climate, we immediately think of the sea, but it doesn't have to be there. It could be along the coast of California where it's more moderate and there aren't as much, there isn't as much fluctuation between the seasons and maybe not the rain that we might see here during harvest. So different things that will affect our grapes in our vineyard. Maritimes sort of in between. It's not as far south and as warm maybe as Mediterranean, but it won't see maybe the extremes that we have with continental climate. So some of you might be big fans of Long Island wines, Bordeaux, those would be considered continental climate. And that's what we see, those grapes planted here, and that's those are the grapes we saw there, and some blending that we go talk about a little bit later. The weather can vary from year to year and more so in continental climates than in Mediterranean. That affects our grapes. Soil, when we start talking about plants, what types of soils and checking pH and nutrition for the plants we have outside or the plants even that we have inside, that can affect what types of plants we might plant, uh, what types of grapes we might plant to see the best results. So could I plant anything I want to in certain locations? And certainly Thomas Jefferson's a great example. He kept planting and planting. He wanted to be very successful, but they didn't know enough about that particular climate and weather with those grapes. Now they've got those grapes planted successfully. So that's great. A question? Uh, yeah. Um, so can you give us a sense of how many different types of grapes there are that are used for wines? Oh, there's only about 10,000 or more. And what makes it worse is the fact that you go to a certain region in Italy and maybe just down the road in the next village or in the next sort of province, they'll have different names for the same grape. So that's part of the certification process. That can be really crazy and annoying maybe because there's these other synonyms for them, but it just keeps on going. And uh, that I, I think it's kind of fun. In fact, I had uh, former student Tito, if he's on, that uh, is going to join that Century Club. There's a group out there that 
uh, tries to accumulate tasting over a hundred different grapes or in those wines and becoming familiar with those different grapes. So that's a fun activity to sort yeah. of drive interest. So the, the question stems from a comment that Yvonne, a question that Yvonne asked, and I think mm -hmm. Yvonne's kind of new to wine because she was asking if there are different types of grapes and does each grape produce a unique wine? But I think you're saying yes, yeah, plus, yeah. They, blend, and I think, plus they <laughs> Yes, it, it can be very unique. And, uh, and yet we can find with the Super 7 sort of a consistency of some similarities no matter where in the world it's planted. Now, of course, I could take a grape and really ruin it when I'm making a wine and it's not going to taste typical. So I just did a wine competition judging yesterday, and we always look for typicity. We look for the characteristics of that grape that we're trying those wines. Even if we don't know the producer or where it's from, we want to be able to identify it as, <clears throat> Dada, here it is, and that's a great example. And so it's much easier with the grapes we're familiar with, but I think the more you taste, the more you'll begin to pick up those similarities. And here's an old world, new world question. Liz wants to know, are old world winemakers still stuck in traditions of how they do it or are they branching into new world technology? You know, there's, that's a great question because there is such variety now. And part of it is, if I use the term flying winemaker, um, perfect example in town here, we have living roots and both owners come from different hemispheres and they'll go down for the harvest uh, early in this, earlier in the year down uh, in Australia, but then come back up here after making wine and getting that started down there, and then come up here for the harvest in the Northern Hemisphere in the Finger Lakes. So the more you see of these different styles, and those are both new world examples, the more you can see that there are many opportunities to learn from so many more people than we used to have. And there's big debate. Is the old world sort of losing its identity because now an, another generation, another generation where wineries that might be 13th generation that can look back at everything that's been done can be definitely limited by regulations of what you plan and how you produce that wine. That's very limiting. And so you will expect that similarity. Or is there something that plays into it with this terroir? Or is there something in it that education. You know, let me try something new. Let me trellis vines differently. Let me experiment a little bit more within, within what's allowed in that particular region. So we are seeing um, some variety and, and maybe we say new school, old school with maybe an, an Italian producer that, well, this falls into sort of a newer style versus the traditional style. And so it is a little tradition and maybe something bumping it up. And I see that especially with some Spanish wines that used to be more heavily oaked and that's a trade-off with fruit, but there's a drive with things like Sauvignon Blanc to push into uh, more fruit and have that appeal to people these days, maybe more so than the secondary and tertiary flavors that come out with age in barrel or age in the bottle. So great question. Yes, there is... Um, because you, you want to um, stand out from your neighbor. So whether you paint your house uh, pink or you use new barrels versus old barrels, uh, stand out, it's a great question. That's great. Does the one guy pest so my, I'm gonna move to the next slide because yeah. we don't want to talk. Okay, did you have another question? Well, as you're getting into the actual tasting, Jane is asking whether there are people who actually can't taste the difference between different aspects of wine. Um, do some people not have it, that it, ability and some do? Well, it depends, I think, also in your interest. So for instance, I uh, don't drink beer as much as wine. And so when I listen to beer people talk, it, it's sort of a foreign language. And when I talk about wine sometimes, people will say it's kind of a foreign language. And so if you want to learn the language, you might be trying more. And that was the biggest difference for me when I started in the business starting at the basics, understanding the basics versus just saying, I have $20 and I just want to buy good wine at $20. You might not understand as much about what goes into the making of the wine, which is why we're going to start with the wine basics. Um, it, it can come if you want to. And so that's why I tell my students to stay on the journey 
because learning as much about the wines you don't like will help you in learning and understanding about the wines you do like. What what makes it that, that style? My tastes have changed over the years, but it doesn't mean that everyone's will. And um, but there is a wine out there, I think, for everybody. And so if you want, if you have the interest, come along. We'll go for a ride. We'll get you hooked on it. Yay! So yeah, keep tasting was the best thing for me. You can read all you want, but tasting's the difference. So winemaking basics, um, old world versus new world. I'll just go over these. We talked about them the last time. And, and for the people who weren't here, obviously great quality. You can make great wines out of great grapes, but uh, you can make bad wine out of great grapes too. And then you get fired. But you're hopefully going to have grape quality that is going to produce great wines. Fermentations are different between red wines and white wines and there's always that to oak or not to oak and where the oak com comes from and whether you're using new oak barrels or old oak barrels or barrels from France, wherever. So uh, if you have the space for oak barrels, that takes a little bit of work and money, but uh, that adds to the style of a wine too. And then um, maturation, how long you might let it sit in those barrels or sit in a bottle before you release it and then Yay, RIT, packaging. Um, that's become such a big thing now, hasn't it? How bag in the box has risen up since the last recession and, and other fun things that uh, you, you see a different sort of packaging all the time now. And the closures are different. Uh, the cork versus maybe a screw cap and uh, the labels are all changing quite a bit. But how grapes grow? The grape really doesn't need a lot. It just needs enough sunlight, enough heat to really ripen. And as grapes ripen, they're going to increase in sugar, swell with water, get bigger. And then as that sugar is increasing, you'll see here, acid drops. So you want to sort of hit that sweet spot, not, not sweet sugar, right? We want to hit that spot where we have things in balance in the vineyard which helps us then when we go to make the wine after the grapes are picked. So you see this WSET slide has the U in there for flavors. Yay! But the flavors become richer, riper in that grape the longer you have in your growing season. And the grape skins can change color from just green, which is how a red grape usually starts out, and then it'll change right before harvest to its red skin. So big changes, but two real basics of sunlight and heat to get those together. So we live in what I would call a cool climate region. <clears throat> Green grapes are the most commonly planted here. They grow well here. They usually require a shorter growing season. Yay, this is a great climate for it. But our grapes tend to be lower in sugar at harvest because they don't ripen as long. And they also tend to be high in acid. And if I'm talking wine and food pairings, and I'm talking uh, just sheer um, <laughs> acid heads, as some people will say, that like high acid, then that's something to look forward to in our cooler climate. Um, some people might say, well, wait a second, New York State mainly produces green grapes, white wine, and I don't know, it's high acid. Is there any other region in the world? Yes, other great regions in France and other places. Germany have cool climates, Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand. So cool climates aren't bad. They just produce different styles of wine. And so mentioned here, Northern France, Germany, those are famous for cooler climate regions. Warm climate regions, I think it's a little easier for some of us because uh, California produces about 90% of our, <clears throat> excuse me, total U.S. production of wine. Well, when you have that higher percentage, most people are going to be used to that style and a little richer and riper, heavier perhaps, because the grapes are higher in sugar. I can ferment that to higher alcohol too, which provides weight. Grapes might be lower in acid, so a little heavier mouthfeel and riper flavors. So the dark grapes, the, the red and black grapes, as they would call it in Europe, the black grapes have longer in the growing season to ripen, and all of that contributes to a little bit more oomph when we talk about our wines. I mentioned California, certainly Australia. I have an Australian Shiraz behind me, too, uh, to talk about our Super 7. So let me, uh, Lorraine, let me just interject yeah. one second. And I love that we have uh, uh, people who are either your former students or they're just really good with wine. So Peter <laughs> says, can we get heavy royal rot Rieslings from Finger Lakes? 
Oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay. So um, noble rot pretty much would be hopefully what we're talking about. And you can get heavily noble rotted, late harvest, um, um, and higher levels of concentration in a single grape so that it uh, provides you just droplets of sugar and still has the acid there to produce great dessert wines that are usually seen in half bottles. And you need water, nearby water, so Finger Lakes or along rivers in Germany. Those are the places where we usually look to Canada for some of these late harvests because you need that late in the season humidity and warmth to produce and help get those grapes into this situation. Not, not, not a lot of people like rot, but the noble rot is something uh, very special. And if it's desired, uh, then you're in luck when it happens. If it doesn't happen, then maybe you wait another year. But yeah, good question. This is definitely a great region for late harvests, and many of you know even ice wines because of the temperatures. <laughs> yep. so one of the grapes um, would be Riesling, and that'll be the top of our Super 7. Yes, Lydia? Yeah. Um, uh, Carlos is asking as you're getting into the Super 7, so we talk about France. <laughs> um, he says, as you're discussing old and new world and France's influence, has there been any research into wine produced in Italy around the Roman Empire uh, and later? Did this influence France and other areas at all? Well, I think you saw um, some of the same people <laughs> going through all the areas. Uh, so certainly Italy's unusual though. And so they'll take me in another direction, which I won't go too far. But Italy's a young country that's only about a little over 150 years old. So all those individual states or provinces that were joined together had their influences. So from um, places east, so Greece influenced. The northern areas of Italy had influence from France and um, um, Austria, Yugoslavia at that time. So all of that influence around there and borders not always being what they are today. There was a lot of mis mi mix and matching and uh, certainly major influence from everyone before them. And just the French really documented it well. And that's one of the differences. So. That's where I start with my Super 7. That's where I always start as a basis because then everything went out from there. And then, then when we get out of the Super 7, Italy has a tremendous amount of different grapes that really uh, are fun to explore. And it usually goes more by region. They're very regionalized. So it's a great question about that early influence because the Romans, to a fault, planted grapes and often ignoring plant, uh, planting crops that would help sustain them. <laughs> Oops. Well, there's wine. So in our Super 7, we have, and I have it arranged as far as almost an order of lightness to fullness. And this depends on many factors, again, climate influencing. But Riesling can be planted in a cooler climate, prefers it. And then Sauvignon Blanc can be done in different styles, but it tends to be more medium body. Chardonnay, especially the ones we're most familiar with, tend to be a little richer and a little fuller. But we'll talk about that more. Pinot Noir is a thin-skinned grape. So when I go to make that into a wine, I don't have a lot of color options for me. And so the wines tend to be, uh, the grapes tend to be preferring a cooler climate. A cooler climate that then, and this is tradition, certainly we know of warmer climates in California that produce Pinot Noir, but traditional, we'll talk about a thin-skinned grape, lighter in color, higher in acid, less body. Merlot is sort of my medium grape. It's the Goldilocks. Who doesn't like Merlot? And it is sort of this medium, plummy, ripe, all over our tongue type grape. Syrah, it can sort of go before or after Cabernet Sauvignon, but it tends to have a little bit more grip to it. It tends to be much darker, uh, maybe a little earthier, meatier. And so that has a little bit more body to it usually. And if we think about Syrah or, and I apologize, I should have had Shiraz on there as well. We tend to pick up that Shiraz as Australian and it's the same grape, same exact grape. But um, obviously in Australia being a warmer climate, big differences in style versus a Syrah from say uh, the Rhone Valley in France, which is a little cooler, a little different style. So Cabernet Sauvignon, <clears throat> that's the one they talk about with beef because it's an unusual red grape. It prefers a longer growing season, unusual that it has high acid, 
high tannin, which we'll talk about in a minute, that sort of mouth grip, that drying quality. And so Cabernet Sauvignon can be a little bit heavier um, and maybe not as easy drinking early in its life in the bottle as something like Merlot. And that's why those two are often paired together. The Merlot can be sort of plump, round, fleshy on the skeleton of Cabernet Sauvignon that tends to be much more bony and structure. So those are two that are a natural pair and are super, so you'll see blending a lot. And that was a question I had a while ago that somebody said, well, isn't blending a cop out? Because don't, don't you just want 100% of these grapes in all of your wines? It's not a cop out and tradition shows that indeed we've been blending and blending for years and years. But in the US we're very used to having it labeled by grape type versus region, which we would see in the old world. And there's a real fight in the new world to try and say this particular region, everyone in this region has to make it this way. And that's sort of not the American way. So we are used to it labeled by variety. <clears throat> that's the way we go. So this is why I love WSET. This is their level one. It only takes about a day to take this class. And I just love it. I'm not being paid to promote them. Uh, but I just love there on the left, you see acidity is high in Riesling, naturally high, and especially because it likes those cooler climates like Germany, Alsace, one of my favorite areas as well. And I love Riesling because it's so versatile. You'll see on the right from dry to medium to sweet. So there's something for everybody. And because it has that acidity, it really can go um, with a variety of foods. It's a great on its own sort of starter, kicks your appetite up with the acid. And then you can go from very floral and delicate or lemon or lime, and then it moves into stone fruit. And by the time you get up to that sweeter style, um, now we're talking about tropical fruits. So it's such a beautiful grape. Um, and of course we have to talk about the Finger Lakes and you got the list on so many places that produce so many styles. Uh, that's one of the things we're known for, uh, usually placed in about the top three. So Germany, Alsace, Finger Lakes, winning awards all throughout the world. So it's a great place to live if you love this grape. Now Sauvignon Blanc, a medium sort of level of our white Super 7, it tends to be higher acid. And in certain areas of the world, we have that uh, sans serre, or as my students know, I'll usually say sans serre, because I sincerely want to sear it into their brains that it's a high acid grape, a high acid wine, but it's labeled after the town. It's, it's named after the region that this grape is grown. This is the only grape for white wine planted there. So when you pick up a bottle of sans serre and it's white, this is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. And the style these days is unoaked. So you might have had California Sauvignon Blanc that might have had some oak. Um, but I really do like this style, New Zealand crisp, bright uh, tropical flavors. Um, but you will find, because if you think about Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon like Cabernet Sauvignon, this grape was actually one of its parents. So Sauvignon Blanc, the savage white, um, has some similar characteristics. You might find some green bell pepper in your, your black grape, your red Cabernet Sauvignon. But now with our white, we'll find apple, lemon, and something fun, like do you smell asparagus in your Sauvignon Blanc? But if you think about what this might go with, oh, I don't wanna jump ahead to pairings, but start thinking about what this wonderful, versatile grape might go with. Chardonnay, well, what can you, what can you learn about Chardonnay? it tends not to be as high an acid grape depending on where it's planted. So in a higher, um, a cooler climate like Chablis, which I've got here. So we've got Chablis is the region. It's not a bag in the box. We, we, we borrowed that place name for our bag in the box, but the bag in the box doesn't have Chardonnay in it like this is. This is 100% Chardonnay. And the basic styles tend to be unoaked, crisp, bright and that real strong lemon or green apple. So that will be higher in acid than something from say, certainly Central Valley uh, fruit from California, or maybe Monterey or Napa or, okay. So just California alone, there's so many different areas, but the warmer that area, usually the lower the acid. And again, that can contribute to mouthfeel, but it's not as bright 
It's not as crisp and mouth-watering, which I get with the higher acid. So you see here white burgundy. Uh, that tends to be more in our stone fruit direction. Uh, white burgundy is where Chablis is located, but further south is what we usually refer to for the white burgundies. Um, something like Puy Fissé, which many people have seen before. Australia, certainly well known for Chardonnays. California, Champagne. If you've had Champagne, a traditional blend would probably have at least a third of Chardonnay in it. So we'll find a wide variety of fruit expression in this grape because from cooler climate to warmer climate, different styles. And where would that vanilla come from? That doesn't come from the grape, that's from the oak. Yes, Lydia. So I think you just answered one question. Uh, we did ask what Champagne's connection is to the Super 7. So I, I think we just got through that. Um, I'll let you know that uh, Elisabetta Demanda is on. She says, ciao. Hey, I already uh, talked about Italy. <laughs> and she has a question about Italy. <laughs> she says, Good. how did French wines use, uh, use Italian wines to boost their alcoholic content in the past <laughs> or maybe even now? <laughs> That's a great question. Shh. Um, <laughs> yes. um, traditionally through the years, especially in poor vintages, uh, many of the wines will be different from what we would have seen uh, a couple hundred years ago because it was common practice, uh, not advertised, that you might borrow wine from maybe southern France to boost some of your burgundies or maybe Italian wine over to Burgundy to boost some of that um, or um, even northern Africa. So it was uh, quite common and uh, now we see uh, uh, still a few cheaters every now and then wind up in jail especially after the sideways movie, the explosion of Pinot Noir, uh, we found that people were selling a lot more Pinot Noir than was planted in France. Uh, so they were using other grapes and just sort of saying, yeah, it's Pinot Noir because there was such demand. So um, uh, deception hasn't stopped. <laughs> Italian wine, we were drinking in our French wines for a long time before we knew it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Um, and many, a couple thank yous for the WSET connection. Uh, a couple people looking to check that out. Um, oh, I've got Therese saying she's drinking oh. a 2016 Freemark Abbey Cab oh. from Napa oh. Valley. One of my friends uh, in Albany uh, gave me a bottle. Um, I had I'd gotten him into wine judging. And I can remember vividly the first bottle I got from Freemark Abbey from, you know, not the one that I bought, but he gave it to me as a gift and he thought it was good. And, you know, that meant more to me that he thought it was good and shared it with me. So Freemark Abbey, what a traditional, traditional wine. That's great. Okay. Now I will tell you, I had good friends who went on a wine tour in California and they were told that Sonoma makes wine and Napa makes auto parts. I don't know if that's still true. <laughs> Well, I do throw that Napa Auto Parts uh, thing in there. Yes, Sonoma's a little jealous of the addition. Uh, Napa only produces about 4% of the total uh, California production. So it's minuscule, and yet they get all the attention. And Sonoma's bigger, and Sonoma produces more. But um, a little more spread out, laid back, maybe, than some of Napa. So it's worth going to both and sort of seeing what you think. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So we do have some questions about uh, some of the red grapes, but I think I'll let you move forward and see if you answer those for them. Yeah, so going back to the champagne question, which was so good, what we don't often see is any color in champagne, and yet uh, red grapes are used, black grapes are used uh, all the time. And in fact, it could be two thirds or more of a blend. It could be 100% red grapes in some of the great champagnes of the world. But um, way back to when Dom Perignon, if anyone's heard of him, this monk uh, started talking about perfecting champagne and the champagne process. And so you use the grapes that are planted there. And Pinot Noir, that thin skinned grape that does prefer a cooler climate, bingo, that's, that's champagne. It's further north. And as a result, now we have something that doesn't have as long a growing season and can very easily be stripped of its skin to provide clear juice. And most of our red grapes around the world don't have any tint to them uh, in the flesh. So strip that skin off and boom, on your way you go. So Pinot Noir you see here famously in Champagne, even though we don't talk about it often. And then the ever popular Burgundy, which I have 
I know before we went on, we were talking about red burgundies and big formats, and there's my woo, uh, big bottle of uh, red burgundy by Louis Jadot, one of the top names there. Um, and New Zealand. Why do they throw in New Zealand? Well, WSET likes New Zealand, and there is some great Pinot Noir being produced there. Um, and I would say great Pinot Noir there. We don't always see it as much in this market. It tends to be a little pricier from a region called Central Otago. So if you look for that, you might be able to find something $20 on up, which isn't always a starting point for many of us, especially college budget. But, um, and I had a school account the last time who was talking about uh, Domaine Druin. And Domaine Druin, Oregon, is a French Burgundy producer who heard about how great the wines were in Oregon, and that has become a just a star in the wine world for Pinot Noir because it can have that cooler climate and some similar soils to what you would see in Burgundy. So this Pinot Noir, you don't see it planted as heavily as other grapes because it is a diva grape. It has small clusters. It really doesn't like a lot of rain. and It's very particular about how it grows. Okay, diva grape, and so you'll see high acid from the cooler climate, but thin skins, I won't have as much of that mouth gritty tannin, so it's a little lighter body. And as a result, it becomes a little bit more of a crossover grape for things you might think about for a white wine pairing or things you might think for a red wine pairing, but not something really heavy fatty usually. So Pinot Noir is very versatile if it's made well. And again, it, it tends to be a little pricier because maybe not as much yield um, per acre. And as a result, you might see the price a little higher. So I'm going to throw in that uh, lovely Oregon region too. Uh, but strawberry, red cherry, you see all red fruit descriptors for this grape and vanilla from the oak. So what comes next? Merlot. So Merlot tends to be medium, medium acid, medium tannin, and it's just easy drinking. But it also shows up, speaking of blending, in our Bordeaux. So in Bordeaux, France, closer to the Atlantic Ocean, Southwest France, you're going to find that they want to blend. They have planted many different grapes in this area, but very regulated about what they can use. And so there's this discussion on the right side of the river, the left side of the river, but Merlot is the main red grape there. So it's you'll see it in many wines. Um, Chile, um, boy, did I drink a lot of Chilean Merlot when I was down there. And you can find inexpensive, cheap Chilean but you can also find some wonderful, expensive Chilean wines. Um, and again, the WSET likes good value, and certainly we see great value for the Chilean Merlot. California, well, it's, it's everywhere. It's uh, all over the place. And it's my crossover red in that it will have some red fruit or it might have some black fruit. And here, the big key descriptor for this often is plum. And, well, plum ends with an M. <laughs> trying, and the blackberry and then vanilla from oak. Syrah, uh, black pepper, spicy. This grape can pick up incredible spice. Uh, that, that dark fruit, licorice, chocolate even. So very um, intense flavor sometimes depending on where it's planted. And you see that oak again. So we tend to think about the Northern Rhone. Um, some of you may have had uh, Croge Hermitage or Cote Roti, some famous names and some often big price tags because there's not as much produced as somewhere Australia, huge. And um, so, yeah, I do have my e, &E black pepper uh, Shiraz that I got when I was down there. Uh, some fun wines and also more expensive. So that tends to be more medium acid, a little lower in the warmer, a little higher in the cooler climates. And then tannin can be quite a bit higher, especially um, hidden, though, by the ripeness in Australian wines. So it might be as high a tannin as some other grapes, but you don't detect it as much because of how ripe that flavor is in those Australian wines. There's Yes, you had a question. Uh, yeah, just two quick uh, questions. One is sure. that uh, with the Pinot Noirs, um, some are called black Pinot Noir. Oh, Pinot Nero. Uh-huh. And so Pinot Noir, Noir itself is referring to, uh, in French, it's referring to that dark, that night, that um, anytime you see a grape with Noir after it, it's going to be a red grape. 
So in Italy, it's a Pinot Nero, and so it's like, oh, okay, it's the it's that black grape. So um, the black Pinot, as opposed to, and it loves to mutate, <laughs> it parties in the vineyard, um, we'll see Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Pinot, lots of things. Um, so you will see other grapes that uh, might have been partying with Pinot Noir at one point, but this is the black Pinot. Yep, good question. Yep. And then Nancy's asking, she says she, she also happens to like black tea. And Ooh. she wonders if that's why she gravitates to Shiraz Shiraz because of yes. the tannins. That's, that's it exactly. If you like strong black coffee, not with the sugar, not with the cream, but if you like dark chocolate, I'm not a dark chocolate fan and all my friends are, so they give me dark chocolate, but don't tell anyone. Um, I'll still take it, but um, I'm just not as big a fan of that bitterness that can come out of it or black tea. Um, I drink black coffee with friends because I'm social, but it's it's just not a big thing for me. And so as a result, I will have my Cabernet Sauvignon uh, with food, my Shiraz with food, because just to have it on its own, there's just an edge to it that I don't that I don't appreciate. I mean, you don't have to like every wine. I tend to have a retail palette. And if you come into a store and I worked there, then I can sell you anything. And I don't mean that I'd lie to you, but if that's what you like, I can find great examples of that. For me personally, um, I'm probably not just gonna crack open one of those. Um, I will have food or cheese and crackers with some of the Shiraz and some of the Cabernet Sauvignons because they're just a little too much for um, my tongue, my taste buds, my brain, I guess. Um, and you can map out. Uh, I talked to the last time about your vino type and what types of wines that can direct you to just based on things you like to eat. And those preferences can help direct you. Cabernet Sauvignon, certainly a lot of people like it and uh, popular because it's high acid, high tannin. And what that can do is give you a wine that can age a long time. So if you're aging Fremark Abbey, if you're aging Great Bordeaux in France, if you're aging all of these wines with more tannin, they'll have longevity in the bottle for you if stored properly because that tannin is a natural preservative for your for your wine. So high tannin, high acid, I'm gonna try and bump it down with something to mellow it out. But here's our black fruit, and there's our green bell pepper we saw with the Sauvignon Blanc, one of its parents, Sauvignon Blanc, and mintiness. Doesn't this sound like an interesting wine? And there's only three descriptors up here for the fruit. Eh, so much more going on, but that's at a higher level with WSET, and you can write down your own descriptors, and that's one of the most difficult parts of this to do, is being able to put into words what you, uh, right on the tip of my tongue, and I just can't place it, and so that comes from practice. Sniff your spice cabinet, but you'll uh, get better at it if you'd like to. So um, Bordeaux, California, Australia again, Chile again, South Africa produces some excellent wines, and this is a good grape for them. So I threw in at the end a dozen tasty tips, and I think you could probably, when this is shared with you, hold this up and go through it a little bit better. I don't want to run too much out of time for chats, but I put together a dozen tasty tips on wine and food pairing, and there's so many books out there on it, and so many great people that have uh, put them together, but these are just a few that I threw together about number one, especially with today, I've got many of the New York State Finger Lakes wines behind me, New Vine, Hazlitt, Fawson View, Idle Ridge, um, Montezuma, Wagner. Yay, I've got their rosé on chill here. Um, so many great wines that you can get locally. Um, or just have the winery ship them to you. If you couldn't get them tonight, you didn't find them in the store, contact the winery because these are alums of ours. So we want to support them too, especially in these times where it took a long time before, or some of them not even opening, but um, being able to sell to the customer is very, very good. Direct to consumer is, is big right now. So what grows together goes together. If you went to France, I tell students, you know, if you go to France, you're not going to sit down and then say, oh, I don't know all these words. Where's your California wine list? <gasps> um, you might get booted out. Same in Italy. They should boot you out because a lot of those cows or other animals are, are 
being milked for cheeses. You're eating so much of what grows together goes together that it makes sense that regional wine with regional food. Um, can you do opposites and you know some other regions? Certainly. Um, I think it's always interesting when I go to Italian restaurants and they have uh, Australian Shiraz on the menu. Okay. California Merlot. Okay. Does Italy produce Merlot? Yeah. Does Italy produce Syrah? Yeah. But, oh well, somebody made the wine list. <laughs> That's a jab at, at certain wholesalers out there tonight. Hi, Donna. So starting your meal with lighter foods and moving to fuller. Okay. Because you don't want to overwhelm your palate at the beginning. It's progressive. Where there's smoke, think oak. Okay. Barbecue big time this, this time of year. Probably pulling out some oaky Chardonnays and oaky reds. But be aware that the higher the alcohol, the hotter you are, the hotter your mouth is, it's going to just volatilize that alcohol. So you might want to have a chilled, fruitier red instead to not blast your head with alcohol. Um, pairing acidic wines with acidic foods. I just thought, I just literally, and this will be embarrassing, but I'll, I'll share it with you. I didn't ever think about chocolate as having acid in it. Yay, bravo for me. But acidic chocolate, dark acidic chocolate, and using that with the pairings with the food. Um, now I've got a whole new thing to work on for the rest of the summer. But pairing acidic foods, fresh out of the garden, your tomatoes now, lemons, and then acid in your food. Well, if you don't have much acid in your food and you have an acidic wine, squeeze some stuff on there to maybe bring up the acidity in the ditch, dish. <laughs> might be ditching dark chocolate, um, to make that pairing work. Watch out for high tannin with oily fish. It'll make it taste metallic. You will have a metallic, it's, it's proven chemical reaction, especially with more umami flavors, that it will taste like you're licking a metal flagpole. And don't do that, especially during the winter. Salty foods can be tricky. And so you want fruitier wines, maybe something with sweetness. Or Cabernet Sauvignon actually is... And tannin is tamed with saltier foods, so that's a good trick uh, to tame some of that. Uh, richer, fattier foods with more butter and oils, beef, duck, foie gras, eh, eh, I have to remove that, I think. Cheeses, like triple creme, I just bought some today, I forgot to put it out. That can coat the tongue and protect it from high tannin and high acid. Or as I tell my students, no glove, no love. So you want to protect your tongue. Question? Nope. We'll keep going through nope. the tips and then we'll we'll come in with the last questions. Okay, sounds good. Foods that are hot and spicy are very difficult. Um, those are very difficult with wine. It can throw them off very easily. Some people start with wine first, food first. Um, it depends how you start. But if you know something's going to be really spicy, go for that fruitier red wine. And New York produces a ton of great ones. Or something with a little sweetness, a Riesling with some sweetness to tame the heat. And that's what I have in my refrigerator. People complain, Riesling bottles are too tall for my refrigerator. Buy a new refrigerator. So um, number nine, make sure your sweet food or dessert is paired with wine that is as sweet, if not sweeter, than your dessert. Okay? Otherwise, it's going to strip all the flavor and make it taste like you've wasted a really nice wine and it becomes maybe more acidic and out of balance. And when adding wine to a recipe, consider drinking the same wine with that dish while you're cooking, yes, and when it's off the heat and on the plate. So continue that wine thing. Don't cook with something really expensive um, because you are cooking off a lot of the maybe finer qualities. But if you're cooking with that wine, drinking with that wine, and serving it with that wine, that works. For me, when in doubt, Riesling Pinot Noir or sparkling wine. Because scrubbing bubbles in that sparkling wine can lift everything up and make it that variety of wine you need with a variety of foods. But it's always personal preference. So Yvonne and whoever is just starting out, keep tasting. Don't let someone tell you what you should like. And this happens all the time with my students. I'm taking the class because somebody knows a lot and I feel stupid around them. Don't feel stupid. Start out where you are and go from there. So if you like chocolate and you like Chardonnay, put the two together. You might like it. Maybe it's not traditional, but go for it. Um, but don't let anyone intimidate you. Um, but get new friends like us. Oh. Keep the wine, get new friends. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. That's perfect. 
<laughs> so oh, we're going to run through a couple of these last questions here. Um, Mike oh, says, I love last harvest Rieslings from Germany, but fortified wine from Portugal, a.k.a. Port, is one of my favorite dessert wines. Um, and I'll add I'm into that, that, that the Rieslings from Germany are probably the first thing I was ever introduced to because my parents, bless their hearts, were stationed in Germany oh. after the war. And so every th every time we drink a Riesling, that's what they talk about is, oh, I remember when we were here and doing this. Oh, it can take you on a journey. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is Mike in Boston, Mike Keegan and Baby or whatever Mike's might be out there, but um, the, when we were talking about that noble rot before, that's what contributes to the creation of these late harvest wines that can be so luscious. And if it weren't for Riesling, I would never have stayed in the business. When I first started out, I couldn't drink reds. And everyone told me, red is the best. You know, you have to be able to drink reds if you're in the wine business. Like, ugh, I was hypersensitive to tannin. But Riesling saved me, or I would have backed out and stayed with social work or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, the, the classic, the best examples, we usually look to Germany for that because they've done them for so long and so well. Uh, but they're so different and yet rich with weight compared to the higher alcohol fortified wines of Portugal. So you might find an 8% late harvest from Germany and a 20% alcohol port. You would serve two ounces each of those, not necessarily in the same meal, but two ounce servings of those because they're so rich and complicated um, or complex. I don't mean complicated. You could probably pour it and drink it easily. But ports are, are truly um, the end of the meal. There's nothing that's going to try and trump that, I think, because of alcohol. And, oof, that's uh, the end of the meal, end of the day. <laughs> All right, uh, question from Andy. What would you pair with an English sparkling wine? Would you, <laughs> would you consider the new English sparklings to be new or old world? <laughs> Hi, Andy. Um, Andy insisted when he took my class that England produced good wine. I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, I've, I've, uh, he, he's paid me back now. I buy, and if Donna's listening, uh, she'll tell you, it can be a tough sell in the U.S., but some of the best sparkling wines, can't call it champagne, but some of the best sparkling wines in the world are coming out of England. And some attributing to a little bit of global warming, that their soils are the same as across across the pond there, um, and champagne, and champagne is investing. Champagne producers are investing in England now because they're getting the right conditions. They can plant the same exact grapes and produce these exquisite sparkling wines. And I've had, I don't know, maybe six different types and producers, and um, I love them. I love them. Um, Andy, you win. <laughs> we have quite a few people, bless your hearts, who are waxing poetic on quarters. We're not going back there, folks, but thank you for sharing. Uh, <laughs> um, we have a, uh, I want to give a shout out to Jenny. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to mess up your last name. Jenny Keller. Yes. Oh. I'm so glad you called Jenny. So I went down to my basement today to find my Rodney Strong Pinot Noir and we have alums all over the world, and um, Jenny uh, was one of my favorite students, like all of them, um, uh, one of my favorite students, and she has a great position out at Rodney Strong, um, and she fought for it. I mean, she was, I think, living in Buffalo at the time, and she said, I want this position, and we had connections, and but she got it herself. I mean, let's face it, she was talented, is talented, but um, I have this great bottle of Pinot Noir down in the basement, and Chris, um, I think her boss is one of my favorite people. Um, so I'm always happy to see people um, in the business and uh, inspired to taste along for the ride. But Jenny, thanks for uh, being here because let's talk wine, right? <laughs> uh, we got a question from Jason. How do you handle preserving a bottle after opening? Recork, vacuums are gone. Or do you feel that you lose uh, too much if you drink it over the course of two to three days? If I open up the uh, drawer to pull some things out, I'll knock over all of my wines from the Finger Lakes. So I won't do that. But um, best bet is I will just put a cork back in my white wine, put it back in the fridge. If it's red wine, if you get vacuum systems that have a pump and a stopper, it pulls out some of the air 
and helps maintain it a little bit longer. But depending on how much air is left in it, that's what's working against you. So if you want a bottle to last five days, you're taking one glass out every day, um, then you probably want to use a vacuum system. If there's more than half of that bottle gone, yeah, if it's especially a more delicate Pinot Noir for a red, I would invest in one of these uh, um, nice little dispensers with the gas system and blanket that wine, and that helps preserve it much better, fresher for a little bit longer. I'm not saying it's going to go much more than a week, though, but you don't want it on the, near the stove, on top of the fridge, in the sunlight in your kitchen. You want to keep it as cool and dark as possible, um, and it'll last a little longer. I Hopefully, uh, I can't drink all the wines I tried, but uh, we'll certainly give it a college try, And uh, but I have to preserve some of them. Just have to. Uh, let's see here. A uh, couple comments. Carlo, uh, who who commented before, uh, is one of your former students. He says yeah. um, the class was great, and the French white Merlot and sparkling Shiraz from Australia were standouts. Interesting. Okay, the sparkling Shiraz might have been Paringa, um, but it could have been one of two others. Uh, that's cool. I was going to say, when, when we were talking earlier, there's a grape called Carlos that I ran into at a uh, Florida judging. So uh, it's funny how you make connections in your brain to former students and places you go to and like, hey, wait, I, doesn't somebody live here now that uh, I want to stop in and see? So uh, yeah, Australia produces some really cool things. They're about the only place you'll see a sparkling Shiraz. They do it well. Oh. So we're back to uh, a packaging question. Frank says, um, bottling is important for preserving and taste, but what about the aluminum canned wine? What I didn't know about the aluminum cans, and it's different for beers, but aluminum cans, depending on what wine you're putting in there, we talked about acidity levels for different grapes. The liner has to change for whatever wine you're putting it in. You could cheat and just go with sort of a basic can, um, take your chances, but eventually if you don't have the right liner, you're not going to have good wine hanging out there. Um, be ready for more canned wine. I have not seen any major difference between canned wine versus the bottle. Uh, we've tried to do um, comparisons to bag in the box and the bottle, and you can wind up with different bottling dates, so it isn't really fair, but, you know, cans are here. Uh, definitely. Cans are here, especially for our staycation boat rides. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of people who are uh, calling for um, a an alumni wine trip, and I think I don't know if Ron uh, Goldberg is on, but uh, yeah, he's contacted me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> well, but, but not about I, the I wine think, trip. Not about yeah, the wine I think trip. we're ready to roll with that. Um, yeah. And then let me see here. I think there was one more question I wanted to pull out of here. Um, I know before we end, I want to say hi to Allison because I think Allison has about five or six other people in her house and uh, uh, I appreciate all of her support. Yeah, mostly I'm seeing uh, some of our seasoned alumni, our more experienced <laughs> alumni, um, saying that they really wish your class was available when they were there. So I think that's a testament yeah. to how much they've enjoyed this. And we've got a, uh, a hello and a thank you from Michael Georgia. Okay. My, jo Joya. Yep. Joya. Joya. I'm sorry. I, I I'm cannot. going to Boston this week. <laughs> I'm going to haunt you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lorraine. We really appreciate oh, no. you joining us again. Um, and for those of you who are interested in, uh, I've had a couple people ask when Lorraine's next webinar is. Um, I think <laughs> I, th I think or you may be in discussions for joining us at Tiger Alumni Week. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so everybody watch your uh, Tiger's Tale alumni newsletter that will come out this Friday. Oh. And if you, if you are not signed up to get emails from Alumni Relations, please make sure you do because that's where you get the Tiger Alumni e-news which tells you when Lorraine is going to appear next. So that's important. Um, any additional questions that you have can be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu and we'll direct your questions to Lorraine. Uh, our audience members will receive an email from us in about a week with a link to today's webinar recording. We want to remind you that Lorraine's first webinar is available on the Alumni Association YouTube site. 
Uh, and the link to that should be popping up in the chat box shortly. Um, if not, just go to the uh, RIT Alumni Association YouTube page and you will find that posted up there uh, fairly early in the listings. Uh, you can view a full listing of upcoming virtual events at rit.edu slash alumni slash events. Uh, we have several coming up each week and we'd like to include you in as many as possible. So Lorraine, thanks again. This was just Thank wonderful. You. Thanks to our RIT um, alum wine people. Oh, absolutely. Um, please exit the webinar by closing your browser window and do let us know what you thought through a brief survey that you are all going to receive via email. Thank Vote you all. On. Have a wonderful evening and everyone please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.